This exam review question concerns chair conformations of cyclohexane. On the left side, draw both conformations of the following cyclohexane derivative given below, and we're asked to follow the numbering scheme that was provided and circle the more stable conformer that we draw. On the right side, using the A values concerning substituent transitions from axial to equatorial, calculate the free energy difference delta G between the conformers drawn in part A. We have to show all our work here. So before we draw in our chair conformations, we just need to understand that axial and equatorial bonds are always alternating in cyclohexane. So for instance, at carbon 1, if we have a substituent that's axial up at carbon 1, that means at carbon 2, it will be pointing down, and then up here at 3, and so on. It's the same thing with equatorial as well. If we have axial up at carbon 1, that means we have equatorial down. And if we have axial down at carbon 2, we have equatorial up here. So, well, let's just say this OH is axial up, just arbitrarily. That means at carbon 2, we have axial down. And that means at carbon 3, it must be axial up. So if we have axial up at this carbon, carbon 1, that means we have equatorial down. So we have equatorial down here equatorial up, down, up. So at carbon 4, this amine group is equatorial up. And if the amine group is equatorial up at 4, that means the methyl must be equatorial down. So now that we have this information, which again is arbitrary, we can draw out our structures. So the first structure will have carbon 1, axial up, so just from experience, I'll point it that way. And then we can just number our carbons. Once we have that, we can start filling in our substituents. So the alcohol group at carbon 1 is axial up. At carbon 3, the isopropyl group is axial up. We'll do that as well. At carbon 4, we have an equatorial up NH2 group, the amine group. And at carbon 5, we have the equatorial down methyl groups. We can draw those in as well. And there's a structure. Before we move on to the next one, I do want to tally up what we have so far. So our axial substituents are the OH group and the isopropyl. And our equatorial substituents are the NH2 group and our methyl. So because of the ring flip, the OH group, which was axial up, is now equatorial up. So we draw that right here. And the isopropyl group which was axial up at carbon 3, is now equatorial up at carbon 3. The amine group and the methyl group here would both be axial and trans. So we draw in our OH group here, our isopropyl is equatorial up, and our formerly equatorial substituents are now axial trans. So just like we did with conformer A, we can tally up what we have. So our axial substituents are now the methyl and amine group and our equatorial substituents are now the ones that were previously axial the OH and the isopropyl so now in part B we're asked to use the following A values which are all delta G values to calculate the difference in free energy between these two conformers so I purposely chose this example because I have four substituents in conformer A, I have two axial, two equatorial, and it's the same thing in conformer B. I have two axial substituents here and two equatorial. So the real question is, which one is better in terms of energy? Because whichever one releases energy, whether transferring from A to B or going from B to A, whichever one releases energy will be the more stable conformer. Delta G from A to B of the forward reaction 1. So how do we harness this information that's given to us here? The transition from axial to equatorial always releases energy because axial bonds are of higher energy compared to equatorial, which are lower energy and more stable. So if we go in the reverse direction, for instance, from equatorial to axial, let's just say an ethyl group from equatorial to an ethyl group axial, we're increasing the potential energy of the compound, so a positive sign is always assigned there. If we go from axial to equatorial, a negative sign is associated with the energy. 
because we're reducing the overall potential energy of the compound and thus increasing its stability. So having said that, we can calculate A to B delta G1. So we observe the structure here and uh, well, let's start with the OH group. So the OH group here is axial up and after a chair flip, it's equatorial up. So going from axial to equatorial is a release of energy. So we assign a negative sign and use this delta G value. We know that the axial isopropyl group has very high energy, 9.2 kilojoules per mole. But when we move it to equatorial, that much is released. So we assign a negative sign. Then we can move to the two substituents here, the amine group and the methyl. We know that these two are in their more stable positions at the moment, equatorial, but following the ring flip, both of them are axial. So that's an increase in the overall potential energy. So we assign positive values to the delta G here. So that's our equation and no calculators, of course. So obviously everyone can do that mentally, right? Delta G1 from A to B is equal to 8.0 times 10 to the negative 2 kilojoules per mole. But we still don't know which one is the more stable compound, right? Because we were asked here in part 1 to circle the more stable conformer, and I chose such a fantastic example. So in order to prove that, we need to look at reaction 2 going from B to A and see what value we get with delta G. So delta G from B to A is just the total opposite of delta G1. The equatorial OH and equatorial isopropyl move on to axial positions, so those will be positive values right here, positive 3.9, positive 9.2, and the transaxial amine and methyl groups will then translate onto equatorial bonds. So we'll assign negative signs here for 5.9 and 7.28. So the transition from B to A is more stable compared to the transition from A to B, which is a gain of energy of 0.08 kilojoules per mole. So for that reason, going from B to A happens to be more stable in this case. So the more stable conformer would be A.